Hello, I'm Tamara Finkelstein. I'm head of the UK government policy profession. It's a really exciting time for the profession with the launch of our new website and also our forthcoming policy festival, celebrating people and places. There is an amazing week-long uh, set of events and we'll end the week with our policy awards where we can really celebrate the amazing policy work that goes on across government. So please join us for this fantastic festival of events. Uh, you can drop in on a few, you can drop in on everything. So please do join us and if you have feedback either on our website or on the festival we'd be delighted to hear from you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Simon Parker, Director of the Policy Profession, um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be able to welcome you um, to the third day of our policy festival. Um, there are loads of really fantastic events uh, going on across the week. Please uh, check out um, the programme and sign up to them. Um, but I'm particularly excited about this one because we're, we're here live with Audrey Tung, Taiwan Digital Minister. Um, I've been following Audrey's story for about four years and they've had uh, an extraordinary career going from um, sort of superstar computer programmer through participation in Taiwan's revolutionary sunflower movements and, and finally into government uh, where Audrey uh, has brought the mindsets and ways of working um, of the digital world firmly into the heart of the way Taiwan operates um, to, to great effect during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think there's loads we can learn about how to use digital um, to deliver really effective outcomes. And I think that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, we are joined by some equally impressive colleagues from across Whitehall. Um, Paul Maltby, um, Deluxe Chief Digital Officer, uh, and Catherine Day, who is a Deputy Director in the National Security Secretariat. Um, and among other things, um, Catherine has been instrumental in helping us to set up uh, the Collective Intelligence Team in Policy Lab, which is bringing some of Audrey's tools and techniques into the UK. Um, one of those tools is a platform called Polis. Um, Polis is a, a deliberative online um, polling tool um, which we've been using um, as part of this session. So about 160 of you have already participated in the, in the Polis debate. Um, if we can get the link in the, in the chat. Um, we've got some results from that. Um, we'll continue to, um, to, to use the Polis tool during the week. Um, please do click on the link. Um, have a play with it. Um, and uh, it is a really powerful tool. We've used it, I think, um, at its biggest with a group of about one and a half thousand people and generated some really fantastic results. Um, I'm going to hand over to Audrey in a moment to talk about their experience. Um, obviously, there is space um, on the Slido bar to put questions in. Please do give us plenty of questions and we'll come to those at the end. I think the talks today will be reasonably short and will maximise the chance for participation. So, on that note, Audrey Tang, over to you. Good luck at time, everyone. Uh, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of open government, um, social innovation, youth engagement, uh, and so on. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here uh, to see uh, that we're joined by all of you who, according to this Polis conversation, uh, agree pretty much with everyone else uh, on pretty much all the important points, except for one, uh, which is whether the UK communities have the agency to influence policy making. Uh, but aside from this 
divisive uh, opinion. I think everybody agree that uh, with modern technology, policy making should be made a lot more interactive with the society and to directly engage the public. And uh, pretty much none of you uh, believe that the journalists will weaponize the transparency uh, for political purposes. Uh, and pretty much all of you agree that it will uh, offer real benefit to the average citizen. Now, uh, think about this shape for a moment because this is not the mental shape that we have for most of our controversial conversations uh, in the society, usually in the more anti-social corners of social media or indeed mainstream media. Uh, people paint a very different picture as if that we put all our calories on the one polarized issue or two polarized issues and don't manage to discover that we're actually pretty much everyone agree on most of the things most of the time. And I believe this is due to the bandwidth of democracy in Taiwan. One, uh, we've been working on digital democracy. Um, personally, I've been working on that for um, a decade or so. Uh, and we've discovered that if you increase the bandwidth of democracy, allowing for more real-time engagement and participation, and if we shorten the latency of democracy instead of waiting for a year or four years, um, people can get real feedback in real time and then finally uh, connect to more people in democracy, then we actually get pretty good uh, results. Now, this is usually the, the time that I started saying oh, this is how we countered the pandemic uh, with no lockdowns, not a single day of lockdown uh, in the 23 million. Um, jurisdiction uh, with just uh, around 1,000 people of casualties or how we counter the infodemic, the disinformation crisis uh, without any administrative uh, takedowns. But because we pre-commit to agenda setting by Polis and Slido, uh, I will only talk about these if people do uh, ask uh, those questions on Slido. And so this is the time that I step back uh, and wait for the Slido and panelist questions. Um, that's my opening remark. Thank you, Audrey. Um, Paul, do you want to come in next? Thanks very much. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Chief Digital Officer at uh, Department for Leveling Up Housing and Community. So um, I'm in charge in my current job of the digital infrastructure of the department, working on services, helping the department make policy uh, fit for the internet age and spreading uh, uh, skills and uh, understanding about, about digital. Um, uh, but I've previously been, um, I, I've done a range of things on um, uh, uh, more transparent government. So when I was back in the cabinet office, I looked after things like data.gov.uk, um, uh, helped set up um, policy lab back in the day and did things like the work on the open government uh, partnership, uh, which was uh, is uh, indeed a multilateral organisation that, that does a lot working about uh, government transparency, working with civil society. I, I just think there's, there's so many interesting uh, 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 things in, in this mix and um, similarly uh, to Simon, I, I saw Audrey, I saw you uh, speak uh, uh, 2018 at a GovTech summit in, in uh, Paris at the time and it's super inspiring and I think just captures a difference of what it can mean when you've got folks in very senior leadership positions indeed in, in, uh, as, as ministers indeed uh, with that sort of different background. Um, I mean, what, what, where's, where's the story? I suppose uh, some things around, you know, there's something here about a, a, a different um, cultural assumptions and ways of working between digital folks and policy folks, which I've always found quite interesting. You know, um, in digital world, we don't code things from scratch each time. We stand on the shoulders of the folks that came before, reuse, open source. It's just normal to collaborate in that sort of way. You can only really build digital services in that way. And it's a very different starting point, I think, from some uh, other bits of government, particularly policy profession. There's some things about what radical transparency means in the UK. And whilst we don't have that perhaps statement right from the top in the way that we actually we did once have like a, a, a maybe nearly 10 years ago or so. Um, there's plenty of great examples across government uh, and maybe we can talk a bit more about uh, some of those and, you know, so. Uh, new ways of working here but just not evenly distributed and all that um and i think you know there's something about for all the things that we do do about transparency digital ways of working the mixture between digital and policy 
And there's something that Audrey's talking about on, what we used to call it e-democracy, I guess. And I've been following some of that for 15 years, is it? And trying to get more people in, interested in. I'm really excited about what uh, polis can mean in the work with Policy Lab. But it's striking the, the, the sort of work that, that Audrey's done. Um, and indeed, you see great examples of this across across Europe and elsewhere internationally. It's not taken hold in the UK and it's been quite difficult to get some of that going, which I think poses some interesting questions about digital disruption into politics and policy uh, in and uh, our world. Thanks, Paul. Um, Catherine, I think one of the things that, that's most interesting um, about your work is that, I mean, when I turned up in government and wanted to do polis, the place it was happening was in national security, which you might be about to say this isn't true, but it felt very counterintuitive to me because this is a world we often assume is quite closed and secretive. And yet you were grasping some very innovative opportunities to open up and engage the public. So I'd, I'd just really like to hear a bit about how you got there. Um, <clears throat> this is true. And um, it's true that it's also unusual um, for our community to be experimenting in this way. Um, just a little bit more about my job at the moment, um, which I think will help to explain this. Um, so I, I'm not a technological person by background, I'm a policy person by background, but I've been driven to experiment with this stuff because um, fundamentally, um, I want us to hand a safer and better world on to the next generation. Um, so my job at the moment, um, and the way you described it, what it means in practice is that it's all about making our future national security system fit for purpose. And I'd really like our current one to be more fit for purpose as well. Um, so putting in place the capabilities and enablers we need to make it work. And I see this sort of transparency as being completely fundamental. Um, I think for me, um, this has come from three different sort of directions. Um, so I've done a lot of work over the last three years on our national security culture and um, we've done lots of big cross-government culture inquiries so trying to reach out to the 70,000 odd people working directly on this stuff and what always comes through strongly um, is that connecting with people um, is consistently not just there as the top priority but that the absence of it is also a national security vulnerability a vulnerability for our society for our country so this is not just a nice to have it's something that to my mind we have got to get better at fast just do it you know there's a lot of interesting conceptual stuff here that we could talk about but i'm interested in accelerating that change the second direction I'm coming at this from is I've had a couple of decades experience now um, working on national security and international work. I've worked in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I've also worked in the centre of policymaking. Um, I've seen lots of failures. Um, and one of the fundamental reasons to my mind for those failures, and the evidence shows this too, um, is a basic lack of inclusion. Um, and transparency and engagement is usually a big contributing factor to that. I don't know if anybody here has read all, I think, 13 volumes of um, John Chilcott's report into um, the sort of West invasion of Iraq in 2003. But um, if you take one lesson from that, it is that the fact that we didn't have that inclusive culture that enabled us to sort of harness what was out there in society and understand how we were impacting people led us to make completely fundamental decision, uh, completely fundamental mistakes. So I'd even go further actually than this sort of idea that it's important for um, democracy in our own countries. It's important, you know, if we are going to sort of you know, work together collectively around the world and sort of go out and do things in the world, then we have to understand how that's playing out. And we need to sort of engage with the people who are affected. Then finally, the angle that, that brought me to this is my academic background as a biological anthropologist, which means that I'm interested in evolution and I'm interested in how our societies and how we run ourselves evolve. And I would really, really like us to uh, sort of pre-evolve. So we know that there's big stuff coming down the tracks at us fast, um, ocean acidification, the effects of climate change. Um, I, I'd like us to preempt that and um, you know, sort of aim off and you know, put ourselves on a better track. But you're right, Simon, um, it's very unusual that such a sort of closed bit of government is um, sort of experimenting um, so much with the work that you've been doing with EDFOL um, to get sort of collective intelligence up and running. Um, I see it as an existential thing, though. And, um, you know, a lot of this is guided by 
um, our uh, new sort of UK national security and international strategy. I will put a link to that strategy um, in the Slido. It's called the Integrated Review. I mean, it, it may be because I, I go to lots of events with people who think like me, which is always a danger, but it, it feels like we're having one of these discussions where we, we all agree passionately this is the right thing to do. Everyone on the polis is agreeing, even some of the cynical people on the polis are agreeing that we need to be more open and transparent. And yet we're not doing it. Um, I mean, Audrey, I'll come back to you. I mean, you know, you, you were coming into, you know, in, into Taiwanese government with a very different mindset. I mean, how did you... How did you find that? Were you welcomed with open arms? Was there resistance? How did you how did you win people over? Yeah, so um, in a sense, we meet no resistance because we are the resistance. Uh, and uh, like pretty much immediately after we occupied the parliament for 22 days, uh, March 2014, that's uh, a lot of us uh, live streaming. Um, we've made it very clear that there is a clear outside game uh, that if the government does not embrace transparency, then people are ready uh, to occupy again. Uh, and so that's that's our context uh, to just say it upfront. Uh, and this uh, occupy is not a violent one, unlike some other advanced democracies. This is a thoroughly nonviolent one uh, where people demonstrated not against something, but demonstrated for something. Uh, this demonstration is a demo of half a million people on the street and many more online on how to talk in a evidence-based manner about a cross-strait service and trade agreement uh, with Beijing at a time being rushed through. So the legitimacy theory <clears throat> was that the MPs were kind of on strike. And because they could not deliberate substantially, uh, well, the people are going to take their office and do that for them. Uh, and so uh, with half a million people on the street, how can we get to a good enough consensus? And that's where the uh, live streaming, uh, the civic technologists, people and so on, under this uh, large umbrella of G0, V or Gov0. So I came from a Gov0 background uh, where there's already budgets, uh, websites that take the PDF files and show the visualization. There's already uh, participation websites that uh, takes those uh, pre-announcement of regulation and so on and offer commentary and so on. Of course, we're a pretty free uh, and open jurisdiction. So building upon that, the G0V people built a lot of tools so that if you enter, for example, your company's uh, name or serial number of registration, it shows exactly which line in the bilateral uh, trade deal affects you in which way. And you can take that uh, into one of the uh, booth around the Occupy Parliament to talk about, say, uh, 4G infrastructure, cybersecurity issues if you work in the telecommunication industry uh, and so on. Of course, the world will talk about 5G a few years later, uh, but you, you get the idea. Uh, and so uh, basically, uh, we crowdsourced uh, what people felt about CSSTA and we focused on just two questions given our very different positions, uh, what kind of common ground, uh, things that we can live with, that we share the same feelings. And given those shared feelings, what innovations can amplify through this um, half a million people on the street and many more online. And uh, the, the thing is that after three weeks, we actually managed to get a set of very coherent demands, which was then ratified uh, by the head of the parliament. So when I became uh, the digital minister in 2016, I, I said I, I work with the cabinet. I'm not working for the cabinet. And my three working conditions are that uh, it's entirely voluntary. I don't give orders. I don't take orders. I uh, I work anywhere, uh, it's telecommuting, uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and finally, every uh, journalist, every lobbyist who meet me must publish a radically transparent record. And so that's like the three immutable conditions upon which that I enter the cabinet. But because I don't give direct orders, so uh, kind of by definition, I don't meet resistance. I only meet with the public servants and the people who agree to have this kind of co-creation and conversation. And we've been uh, doing more than 100 of those collaborations collaborative meetings, some driven by popular e-petitions, some driven uh, by the youth counselors, some driven by the public servants themselves raising those topics. And we on average handle about one every two week or uh, one week. So I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Audrey. Um, Paul, I'd be really interested in your perspective on this, because obviously, I mean, very, very different context. We haven't had our parliament occupied, at least not yet. Um, how do you see the kind of the, the barriers we face in UK governments and what can we do about them? Uh, 
So sorry, I think I'm having a, look, a few uh, connectivity uh, gremlins. Um, was that to me, Simon? It was, yeah. Shall I repeat it? And just sorry, and just say again. Sorry, it was just a, a bit clicky. Oh, please don't worry. I was just saying, um, you know, obviously our, our, our context um, is is very different um, to the one Audrey's just described, um, and we're trying to sort of push this stuff through quite a big bureaucracy to make change happen. How have you experienced that in in your time working in digital? Yeah. It, 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 I think that's true, and I think you know there's there's a there's it's not just a, a singular pursuit. There is a, a you know a community of folks working in and around government that do see the world in that sort of more collaborative policy professions um, uh, way of doing things through the open policy making stuff that we used to do with with Jeremy Hayward back in the day. So it's, it's it's not new, and I think there's some really lovely examples of it too. So it's not something that is not done here. It's just something that does not have the focus and drive and ambition uh, in the way that, that Audrey set out. So what does that mean? So uh, within the digital technology spaces, of course, we share our code on GitHub, and that's open source, of course. Um, there's a lot around open data still. So what we're doing on uh, planning reforms, um, and I'll put a link in there. You know, it, it's it's a it's it's getting machine readable data that people can use to make other digital services on the back of. Some of those are around uh, engagement with um, people about. Uh, planning decisions in their area about that very contested question about land and its use um, but some of it is about other types of digital services that you know we may never have um, understood or invented yet uh, indeed that drive productivity within those within those sectors that surely need it too um, I think within government you see quite a different mix of this so at one level of course any good policymaker goes and interacts with the people that are using those services the frontline people that interact with them that's just been part of the policy um, officials role for a long time but often it's not done quite so systematically you do see great examples policy lab has been you know really proud of the work from policy lab over what's nearly 10 years is it now um uh, of of the work we've done to push things like um, design skills, user research by default into, into groups, but also I see things like having multidisciplinary teams. So there is a uh, one of the most annoying things about government, as I say, is this sort of split between a policy world and an operations and digital world, if that's the sort of the focus. And I think increasingly there's just like just multidisciplinary teams where you're thinking about the services and you're understanding there are big questions here about scope and nature of the service but also lots of technical questions about how you do a thing different tools that are available to us in this modern age that perhaps you know sometimes I think policy making is I started as a policy official back in the day in Belair's strategy unit and in many ways the tools that I see in the way in which we do things in policy looks very familiar to that 2004 world that I joined back in the day and you know the internet's come it came for Woolworths it came for blockbusters it's come for politics uh, but still st strangely um, uh, the UK government seems relatively immune from the uh, disruptive forces of the internet but I'm surely uh, surely it is coming and indeed we can use and embrace some of those uh, changes but you have to you know sometimes it is going with the flow finding those opportunities and moments where you can make change where there's a space to open up change um, and I think um, policy makers are often very alert to how power flows how information is flowing where those spaces can be possible I think is is actually one of the deep skills of UK uh, policy profession but perhaps the drive and ambition uh, is something that we can help with. Thank you Paul. Um, Catherine interesting reflections on that but I've just been having a look at the Slido so I'll start pulling off a few questions from there and there's one which I think is, is lovely for both you and Audrey because I think it's very relevant um, and it's about the international dimension here and you know if we are open and transparent about policy making doesn't that give foreign actors um, the opportunity to, to hack the way that we make policy making is, is openness risky in that sense um, I know Audrey has lots to say on that but Catherine I'd love to hear from you on it first Um, I'm more interested to hear from Audrey about that, um, but I, I would quite like to react to um, the conversation that's just been going on, because um, the sort of why don't we question just 
has hit us time and time again. It really resonates with me. Um, and I think something um, there's something big about how we have evolved as a system and understanding the reasons for that um, so that we're then able to um, you know, get over these barriers. So there, there are very, very good reasons that we're not automatically um, set up to be transparent. Um, and some of the things that um, just are quite interesting to reflect on, just listening to Audrey earlier, um, I was thinking there's a very big practical um, sort of motivation to do this, isn't there? And um, John Murphy put a question in the chat about Chilcot and you know, what we've done since then to try and counter that lack of an inclusive culture. And things like that um, all help to sort of build the momentum for that sort of change. Um, but there are some quite practical things. You know, our civil service code is quite an interesting thing to think about because it sets out really, really important values. But then the way in which we um, sort of see those values through is that we um, are, um, ge we generally tend to account to the public through ministers. And, you know, is that something that we need to think about? So to sort of encourage us to account much more directly to the public. Um, but the most important thing actually is, is this interest to my mind and you know, these very, very specific objectives about how this sort of engagement actually gets outcomes. Thanks, Catherine. So I mean, in the, the international influence question, Audrey, I mean, you, you have a very large neighbour that's very interested in influencing you. So how have you managed that? Yeah, uh, for us, it's, it's international and they're interested in calling it domestic. That's the entire sunflower movement in one sentence. So uh, yeah, we, we've seen uh, one, uh, for example, this uh, is a um, information manipulation uh, that we've seen um, just leading to the January 2020 presidential election. Uh, and it says uh, Hong Kong sucks, compensation exposed, killing a police earns these people up to 20 million. Of course, that's not true, but it's designed to interfere uh, with our presidential election. And uh, and it, it's uh, linked to this very scary looking uh, photo, which was from Reuters. Uh, but Reuters didn't really say anything about paying um, these people to kill police, but rather just there are young people in Hong Kong protesting. And uh, uh, this alternate caption, uh, which is on the right, uh, actually came from the Zhuang Zhenfa, which is uh, which is the political and uh, law unit, the Weibo account of the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. Uh, but now, if we do a Nets DG style, um, you know, takedown, or we do any sort of takedown, um, if we censor it, uh, then it actually feels the conspiracy theories uh, and the foreign interference actually uh, gets this uh, amplified result because the our value, right, the, the basic transmission right of their conspiracy theory actually increase if we take down anything. So we instead uh, went for radical transparency, namely notice and public notice. Once the independent journalists fact check the story, um, we uh, work with social media platforms. So every time you share, you see that this is being sponsored probably uh, by the Zhuang Zhenfa Wei Chang Zian, right? And, and now um, this clarification now serves as a kind of viral vaccine because the more people uh, share, the more people understand, oh, there's information manipulation going on. And the same uh, goes for like on the election day, uh, another information uh, manipulation that said the CIA made invisible ink for ballots and so on. Again, it's dispelled by radical transparency by people literally going into the voting booths and live streaming um, the counting process. And we allow people from any party whatsoever, the popular YouTubers uh, join it. And then uh, just a month later, uh, when the medical grade masks uh, become a something that people uh, rush to buy, again, there's a uh, cybersecurity phishing attack uh, for people who share this. Uh, their emails don't get masked, but rather get computer viruses. Uh, but it's again uh, fixed by the GovZero people working with us, where we publish the real time inventory of the medical grade mask in each pharmacy upon collection. So it's every 30 seconds in more than 70 different tools. So people queuing in line can see that it's being distributed uh, in a fair way and uh, there's no need to panic. But uh, the opposition party of course uh, work on the numbers and figure out that it's actually biased uh, and then they did a interpolation in inquiry in the parliament and the minister simply say a oh, legislator teach us how to distribute better because well the uh, MP doing the inquiry was VP of data analytics at Foxconn and Mr. Chen was like yeah you should know better uh, about data than we than we do so given the exact 
exactly the same data published upon collection uh, tell us how to uh, distribute better. And so that turns opposition party into co-creation party, and we implemented her suggestion just 24 hours down the line. Thanks, Audrey. Um, we've got lots of questions and lots of things. I'm, I might sort of pick out Polis next as a tool because there's a few people asking how we, we've actually used that. And it's something that we can talk about from the UK perspective. Um, but Audrey, sorry to come to you again, but it would be really useful just to hear a bit about how you've used Polis to inform decision making around issues like ride sharing in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we basically just use it like Google Forms uh, now, right? But ex except, of course, instead of a survey that's being written by us, is the survey that's only seeded by us uh, and then co-created with, with, with everyone. So we have this public infrastructure, uh, polis.gov.tw, that all the public servants can just go there uh, and start a polis conversation at any time. Now, uh, the first time we used that in 2015, that was a little bit more experimental. Uh, and when we did that, as part of the V Taiwan exercise, um, it was 2015, and the Uber people, you know, were saying that uh, it's a little bit like the the. Um um, distributed ledger people nowadays uh, saying the code should triumph over text and norm because of uh, their algorithm dispatch cars better, uh, their algorithm should uh, have a superiority over existing ride sharing laws because our laws are out of date or archaic or whatever. Uh, but uh, people don't feel the, the same. Uh, so we set up this conversation where we asked people, okay, so despite all those differences, uh, how do you actually feel about this statement? Uh, and then uh, we actually get people People to agree on pretty much everything. Uh, people gradually converge toward the middle, uh, and um, instead of the Uber drivers and taxi drivers and union people and so on. Um, disagreeing on like just one thing, whether it's called sharing economy or gig economy or platform economy or exploitative economy. <laughs> People actually all agree that insurance not undercutting existing meters, serving the uh, places less accessible by uh, professional taxi fleets and so on. There, these are all important points. So we got uh, the representatives from pretty much all the different sides, uh, just like we're doing now, answering to the police uh, agenda that's crowdsourced by the people and we do not actually ignore any uh, top consensus. If it's broadly agreed by people of different stripes, then we always uh, just ask those people uh, who are wearing those different banners uh, to commit, like saying, uh, these are the good enough consensus, why don't you just commit to it? And then we get this live stream to verbal commitment from all the different stakeholders. Uh, and then we just ratify that as the Diversified Taxi Act. And uh, so just not even one year later, 2016, uh, we ratified that. And nowadays, of course, for a couple of years now, uh, Uber has been playing really well with the um, social entrepreneurs here because they are a legal taxi company. Uh, but the local churches, local temples and so on can also form their Uber likes reusing the same piece of legislation that enabled this kind of diversified taxi. So it's a win-win-win situation. But uh, the way that we can find this kind of coordinated action solution is entirely through this crowdsource agenda setting that's seeded by Polis. And, and Audrey, a few people in the questions are kind of asking about in inclusion you know, and how do we ensure that kind of engaging online doesn't exclude people who don't have internet access who are less literate. Um, how have you coped with the danger of amplifying um, mm -hmm. the voices who are already powerful online? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would just point out that all the previous consultation methods share the same weakness. So if we do not uh, replace any consultation methods, we just add to it, then we don't actually suffer from digital exclusion. What I mean is that I'm not saying that this police conversation supersedes referendum or it supersedes focus group or it supersedes any part of policy making. What we're is essentially saying is that instead of just, just running a telephone poll uh, in the very beginning, of agenda setting uh, run also a polis. Uh, and so uh, we're not replacing any downstream activities. What we're doing is just to crowdsource the kind of surveys that you any run anyway at the beginning of the policymaking cycle. And so because of that, it gives better quality information to everyone involved and the uh, parliamentarians do not feel that their uh, link to their local constituents are being threatened uh, by the polis tool, uh, which is why we always run it on the very beginning, the agenda setting stage instead of uh, using it to replace any face-to-face -face, uh, ways. And now uh, the other thing I want to note is that this builds upon broadband as a human right. So even theoretically speaking, we're not excluding anyone in Taiwan. 
Thanks. Um, I'm going to come to, to Catherine because, um, Catherine, you're, you know, you're, you're the person who, when I came into government, I discovered was using this tool. So it would just be really interesting to hear a bit about how you've used it in the context of the integrated review. Um, so there are um, two things that I would say in response to that. Um, firstly, um, I wanted to use it. And hello, you're meeting Squid, small dog in the background, who I'll introduce to you um, if she comes close to me in a minute, but so, so that you can hear the yapping. Um, I, I wanted to use it to help us to shape um, the UK's future national security and international strategy. So the integrated review ended up being a two year process um, of, of you know, sort of reviewing where we were on foreign security development and defence policy and you know, setting out our sort of five to 10 year strategy for the future. Um, we didn't manage to, for various reasons, um, get, um, get polis off the ground in that time frame. Um, so what we did instead um, for the integrated review itself um, was a public call for evidence and um, you know, something sort of that looked like a much more standard consultation process, which was pretty straightforward to get signed off. Um, what we were able to do in the integrated review itself, though, um, was pull out how um, important this type of citizen engagement is for the future. Um, so strategically, um, we have these sort of four big objectives that we're aiming for as a country. Um, and we recognise that achieving them has to be a whole of society effort. So in today's complex world, there's no way that we can strengthen resilience at home and overseas or shape the open international order of the future, for example, um, as government alone. It has to be a collective effort and COVID's shown that. Um, so we, um, we, we recognise the need for this. And then secondly, we've put in some specific commitments to what we'll do in the future. Um, uh, so we um, have put in the Slido, uh, we've, we've committed to connecting better with our citizens, we've connected, we, we've committed to making better use of these new platforms to um, sort of improve our participative processes, um, for example. And then there are some ideas in there that I'm um, sort of really keen to build on as we get into our second year of integrated review delivery. So I'm really delighted that one year on we've been able to run a public debate um, sort of limited public debate, but a public debate nevertheless um, on that strategy and how we're doing. That's been brilliant. Um, but looking ahead, um, I'd like to think about ways in which we can sort of more actively mobilise that um, that actual effort and actual action. So it's not just about debating, is it? You know, it's about enabling participation. It's about um, people being able to participate in an informed way. I mean, that is a very, very important thing to think about, I think, and you know, speaks to what we do with our education system and how we bring people up to understand you know, the active part that we need everybody to be playing in society if this is going to turn out well for us. Um, and then there's actually sort of you know, mobilising the people who need to act. So one of the commitments that we've not quite nailed in the integrated review um, is to a civilian reserve um, as an enabler for that. And then what that looks like, um, you know, I'd, I'd really like there to be a sort of big sort of transparent participative element to that. Um, and maybe this is something that we could shape together. Um, I think that this group is a great start to you know, sort of getting us working in different ways. And it's tremendous to see so many people here. Um, and I think that you know, it gives me a lot of hope that um, you know, we can each, I hope, take from this a commitment to work in more transparent ways. And you know, let, let's try things out. Um, you know, I think that we're still at a pretty experimental stage. That's what it feels like to me. I'm not sure that there are sort of really clear front runners yet. Um, you know, I'm interested in polis as a debate platform. Um, I think that we need sort of cleverer stuff to you know, enable us to collaborate together. So one of the experiments that I'm running now, for example, is, um, you know, can we get a wiki platform up and running for our, our mission critical culture, diversity and inclusion toolkit? So we've developed this toolkit which is designed to enable anybody um, to improve our workplace culture and its diversity and inclusivity and um, I want to try putting it on wiki to see if actually that's a good way of gathering in case studies and you know getting people sort of co-creating what we do about it um, yeah there we go sorry big ramble I'll stop there Right, excellent ramble I'm um and I, I agree with your point about experimenting because I've sort of I've, I've heard 
Audrey speak about polis before, and I'm struck that for us, it's this exciting new thing. But in Taiwan, you know, it's it's kind of it, it's mainstream now. This is no longer experimental. Um, but it does speak to the need to, to try more things. I think I'm, I'm particularly excited myself and Ed Fowler have been reading a book called Superminds, which talks a lot about an approach called the contest web, which has been used to break down complex problems like climate change into sub problems and run policy competitions on each of them. Um, and we're both quite interested in whether we could produce something similar for the UK policy making. So that's that's my next one, Catherine. Um, Count me in, Simon. <laughs> um, always. Um, Paul, I was really struck earlier by your comment that um, digital democracy, and I guess it, it speaks to what I just said, digital democracy is much more mature in other parts of the world and it hasn't really taken off in the UK in quite the same way. I mean, can we can we imagine a world in which we're using tools like like polis to actually frame policy decisions from the outset you know you're sitting in a policy department with a huge agenda right now could you imagine a policy debate framing a leveling up mission yeah and you know i think you know and i think i can see it in some of the uh, comments on the slido as well and i think often when we think about okay this is all lovely what we're hearing on the screen here and um and maybe there's these sort of um, the sort of paradise in little corners of government in the UK or a much more mainstream example in Taiwan. But I, as I'm sitting here as a policy official within government, I just can't work out how I would do this within my current environment. And I think there's something here about understanding where the space is to be able to do these sorts of things. And there's something about where we work quick and where we work slow, because, of course, we operate in a in a political environment and one with a very rapidly moving news agenda and the the, the you know, the flexibility of our of our ministers to be able to move and deal with those is a is sometimes we see sort of the infuriating side of that on the other side. But of course, actually, it's there's a genius side of actually managing those those movements, too. But I think, you know, sometimes the the policy agenda moves much slower than we give it credit for, because we all run around very quickly, very busily every day trying to do all the things. But actually, you know, there's some agendas that have that space and that that opportunity. Sometimes it's because they're slightly less and out of focus. So uh, things like, um, uh, you know, some of the reforms we're doing on uh, local government and digital capabilities, software, uh, the way in which... Um, work happens in in local government. I know you, you know an awful lot about Simon, but um, you know, there's a space there actually slightly outside the frenetic political agenda where we can make those those shifts and changes. And similarly, what the sort of stuff that Catherine's talking about is, can you imagine us saying that on national security and you know defense of the nation, these are not topics you would normally think about um, uh, perhaps in the recent past as being with but actually sometimes when things are difficult you also have the space and time I, we worked on um the digital economy act back in the day 2017 was it where we were uh, changing the law about uh, data sharing and data access uh, within government and outside of government and that is a very contested debate both by those that are very conservatively not wanting to do things but also those if you like from a privacy point of view that are very advanced at a technical level but also see the dangers of doing that so negotiating a space through that we use policy lab we used uh, 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 an organization called involve to bring some of those conversations together and i'm struck with what you know as audrey talks about uh, some of these things of actually that we we are much more in common than you than we typically think as we go into the room with a more polarized debate and i think that's where some of these techniques can happen and it's, it's something that i would say with with uh, policy folks in the UK is spot those opportunities. I think a second thing is thinking about these these skills are not super specialized or they you know can be, but there's no reason why our teams need to be so monocultural. I still struck with you know whole teams of policy folks in government looking after a particular domain and indeed uh, you can see that also um, you know, uh, siloed in, in digital and technology teams too. But as I mentioned before, the sort of multidisciplinary team thinking about services rather than policy or operations, bringing those spaces together, actually you get that interplay between humans in our teams working together, sharing their expertise. In digital teams, it's not just all people coding. We have user researchers and designers and architects and uh, yes, developers and others, but we have these, these mixed team models um, which is, you know, how we how we get things done. And then the last thing on that sort of like, how do you get started? Another thing I would say is the, the 
I sort of mentioned, I hinted at it before, didn't I? But it's there's something about policy. The policy world still feels um, strangely similar to the to the one that I first came into when I came into government. And I think there's a bit here which is, folks, don't get left behind. This the world is changing, and this thing as a question in the slider about, look, what can I read in this space? And actually, there's loads of stuff. Like the best thing is to go and do stuff, right, rather than perhaps reading about it in an abstract. But there are, we'll put some links in the chat. But, you know, this thing about making it part of the normal policymaking discourse, not to go, oh, I'm not a techie. How many conversations start with, oh, I'm not a techie, which sort of just pushes it all off into a distant space. That means you don't really have to worry about it. Some folks who work in the basement of fix the printers will probably come along in the minute and make it all right. But actually, these are mainstream skills. These are mainstream leadership skills to understand the Internet. It's, it's business models as much as the technology. Things like platform approach to government, platform uh, ways of, of thinking, the way in which data flows. These are these are fundamental shifts to the fabric of how uh, uh, of the tools that we should have in our policymakers toolbox in order to affect change that our ministers want. And I think there's a there's an onus on all of us to 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 get our heads around this stuff. You don't have to be sitting there. Uh, programming in Perl or something like you know you, you can actually there's a the, there's a there's a depth into this space that that actually is should and uh, should be expected in my view to be uh, there and available for all policymakers and other officials within the uh, within the government system. That was bound to happen at some point. Um, Thank you, Paul. Um, there is a great question on, on the slide about books that we would recommend, which um, I'll save, I think, maybe for the end, if everyone could kind of come up with a suggestion. That would be amazing. Um, Audrey, there is a real theme, I think, in, in both the, the polis debate and the, the Slido, um, which is you know, we can try and engage citizens much more. Um, but what about the citizens themselves? Do they want to engage? Are they getting overwhelmed? Do they understand the issues well enough? To, to engage with us and to really define the terms of policy. I'd be really interested just to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, I think most of our collaborative meetings uh, stem from a real desire from the citizens to get um, a, a accurate context of what's happening. What you're seeing is the airbox network of literally all the primary schools in Taiwan contributing at least one PM 2.5 sensors uh, and uh, people in their balconies and so on. Uh, in the beginning of this movement uh, in 2015, uh, people barely understood what PM 2.5 does uh, to our, our health and uh, gradually more and more people become aware of it and then they blame the government for only have less than 100 PN 2.5 sensors around the islands, uh, and then people just took matters to their own hands. Uh, and then it, it actually uh, created a lot of pressure uh, to the cabinet because uh, there's just no way that we can invest into the high accuracy PM 2.5 sensors quick enough to answer the, the communal demands. So I, I always say that uh, we work with the people, not for them. So instead of asking people what they want, uh, work with the people that already uh, are taking matters to their own hands anyway. Uh, and then uh, we set up this annual um, sort of friendly competition called Presidential Hackathon, uh, where 200 teams compete, uh, but uh, they actually need to get cross-sectoral buy-in. We use a what we call plural voting, a new uh, quadratic voting method to surface the synergies between the 169 different SDG targets that those teams target. And then the top five team get this trophy, which is shared Taiwan with a micro project if you turn on the projector, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, giving you the trophy, promising whatever you did in a small town or municipality will become national level infrastructure with all the personnel regulatory uh, and uh, um, budget if needed uh, in the next fiscal year. So we've been running that for five years. And I think that's one of those nowadays more routine things for people to simply say, oh, let's just work with the presidential hackathon champions uh, to figure out the data collaborative to take in the latest need uh, by the citizens, because there's a lot of kind of small, uh, cheap but cheerful wins uh, across uh, like just five championship teams every year. And then if you're interested, just check out presidential hackathon. I think that's one of the the other thing that uh, start feeling avant-garde five years ago, but now it is just part of the social fabric around digital social innovation. 
And I'm really struck, particularly when I've heard you talk about um, about COVID and your response, that having a really strong community of civic hackers um, outside government meant that you could move really quickly because they would be able to produce, for instance, maps of where you have masks very rapidly. Mm -hmm. How important to your story has it been to kind of have one foot inside government, but also a big movement outside of it? Yeah, I, I'm really just the face you know, of the Capsira movement. Uh, it's the thousands and thousands of people uh, who look at everything that we do wrong uh, from the government on the digital service side, uh, because the entire G0V thing is a domain name hack, right? Just so that if they see anything wrong with anything that GOV, that TW, they can just uh, rename the O to a zero. So if you don't like our national participation portal, join that G0V, that TW, uh, that GOV, that TW, just change it O to a zero and you get into the shadow governments with better engagement and so on. So it's always open source, but this is nowadays what the young people are calling a soft fork. It's a fork in the road that takes what we already have in digital service delivery, uh, but trying to deliver it a very different way, but always it's open source and in the creative commons. So it's ready to be merged uh, in any given moment. It's not just mask rationing or very funny dog memes to teach about physical distancing and washing your hands, but also also genuine uh, innovations like instead of uh, paper and pen based contact tracing, this very natural building camera contact tracing where people just scan this random 15 digit code on 7-Eleven and other venues and then it sends this 15 digit random code through this built in uh, camera into the 15 digits into the toll free number 1922. What it does is that it registers uh, your whereabouts in a way that cannot be used to identify yourself and is posted only on the local telecoms uh, accounts for 28 days. So if nobody uh, wants to scan a QR code in your French uh, corner, maybe because they are 70 years or 80 years old, uh, you can use a flip phone uh, as well. But uh, at the end of the day, when the contact tracer need to figure out who has contacted which person in the venue, uh, they just uh, get a record uh, in a reverse auditable way. And people can get to this website to see which contact tracer people in which municipality have looked at their data in a way that's reversely accountable. So the, the point I'm making is that with this civic tech, uh, what used to be uh, like large investment by Google and Apple or a large surveillance state invention and so on is now actually uh, it could also be co-created by open source grassroots people who of course care about privacy enhancing technology and things like that and you get all of these for free and all you need to do is to uh, kind of just step back as I did in the very beginning of this Q&A and say I don't I, I won't go on and on and I commit myself to answer to whatever that has the highest rough consensus on Slido and Paris. And I think one of the um, one one of the, the again it's a theme that's coming up on the, on the slide. But one of the fears that people have about doing this in in the UK is that the the public will will ask for things that we can't do, or they will ask for things that politicians don't want to do, um, or question some big policies um, that that we have. Um, I mean, have you had a situation where you know a, a policy debate, for instance, has come up with a with a, a consensus around issues where the politicians have a different view? How, how have you navigated the clash between openness and political accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But uh, as I mentioned, police is just about agenda setting power. So we, we never commit ourselves to implement exactly as ask. We just commit ourselves to answer the really difficult questions that has the highest votes. Uh, and so that's a very different view on things. Otherwise, we'll be calling it a referendum because <laughs> a binding quorum is a referendum, right? So uh, we, we've already had a lot of discussions on either e-petition platform or joint platform uh, that does not agree uh, with the governmental directions. But that's that's entirely fine because what we're asking is essentially a set of shared values outside outside of whatever polarization we have. So we commit ourselves to implement only the part that, that has broad consensus, including the public servant who participate. When we co-create a tax filing system, uh, we deliberately uh, include as the facilitator of breakout groups, the participation officer from other ministries like the Coastal Guard or people who don't have anything to do with the Ministry of Finance. So of course, even they are public servants, they feel very differently from the Ministry of Finance when it comes 
to the redesign of the tax agency's uh, flagship app. But when we talk about opening up the ocean for amateur fishing and so on, it may be the financial uh, supervising council's participation officer actually take the surface side because they also surf and fish uh, during their spare time and so on. So uh, what, what it does is that it creates this reliable mediator between the people who know few things about uh, public administration, but a lot about their domain knowledge vis-a-vis -vis people who within that agency who knows everything about the public administration, but not that well connected to stakeholders. The participation officers in other uh, agencies and uh, ministries in any given collaborative meeting serves as this middle ground to find the uh, rough consensus that can actually be implemented in a reasonable time frame, usually 60 days. And then we just table the rest saying that uh, we've not found, um, you know, good enough consensus there, but welcome to start another round of conversation. So just small and quick wins that builds trustworthiness over time. Thank you. We're heading into the last few minutes of the discussion. So what I think I might do is um, do a quick round of sort of final thoughts from all the panelists, which could it could include the book please. Um, so if we go for, for Catherine first, Paul, then I'll ask Audrey to, to round off for us. So Catherine, oh, and I'll do my book at the end as well. I'll think about the book. There are so many. Um, I was just recently talking to um, a guy who used to run organisations. He's committed the last 15 years of his life to studying neuroscience and he's thinking about the quantum organisation. And we got into a conversation about, well, what would the quantum government look like? And Audrey, I think that you're moving us towards it. Thank you. Um, I mean, just listening to the conversation was making me think um, back to my sort of biological evolutionary roots. And I was thinking about society as a big organism. Um, and if we think about it that way, for me, um, transparency and everything that we've just been talking about would be the circulatory system. Um, so the thing that enables the lifeblood to circulate, so the thing that brings in sort of ideas from wherever they are, the thing that sort of you know, mobilises people to play their part, gets the bones and muscles to do their job. Um, but I think really what comes uh, through strongly for me is that um, this is an, an abstract thing. Um, you know, we, we know, um, including from the integrated review work that we did, that it's existential and it matters and we have to get on top of it now. And um, so we, we can and must get over the obstacles. There are practical things that we can all do. Um, I've suggested in the Slido that we make this the start of something and build a network and support each other to sort of do practical things about it and build on some of the amazing ideas, Audrey. Um, I love that presidential hackathon. And I just love the way that you have such fun with all of this stuff too, which I think, is such a good driving force for humans. You know, we're going to want to get involved with creating, well, I want to get involved with creating very funny dog memes. Um, I've always thought that humour is so powerful. I mean, the cartoons in Iraq um, when I was there, just amazing. Um, and Russian humour as well, fantastic. Um, so if we can each make that commitment, um, that would be amazing. Um, and, you know, we, we will implement this. We'll get there. Thank you, Paul. Brief final thought and a book, please. So, so for a book, I, I sort of go back to 2010, and and um, it's not directly, it's, it's relevant, but it's uh, Tim O'Reilly's um, government as a platform, and I think it's like one of the foundational texts of sort of modern digital government. It's all a bit West Coast, and it's 10 years or so out of date, but still, I'm always surprised because it speaks to me as a policy official as much as it does a, a digital official, and it's something that I wish that if there was one thing I wish that. Um, the UK government policy folks uh, had got in their head. It's just those business models of platform government and platform entities, so that. But the real thing is, I want to kind of follow with Catherine, is like, this is the internet we're talking about. So the answer is not the most important person in the room. The answer is us, it's, it's this community. So, you know, are you looking at blog.gov.uk and looking at the great posts that are coming out from teams right across government of all different types? Is your team writing in that? If not, why not? Look at the great folks that are there on Twitter and other bits of social media. So I look to people like Janet Hughes at DEFRA doing her work on future farming and our colleague from Government Digital Service, uh, our own our own uh, local digital team there on uh, LDGov UK uh, on Twitter, but essentially local, di local digital, just talking about what they're doing day to day 
here we are building a community, building that alliance. And I think this is the power of this moment. It's not the top down hierarchical, you know, the most important person in government said that this is the thing, so we should all go and do it. And it sort of trickles down in that sort of ordered way. But this is this horizontal collaborative network of people that's porous from inside government and outside government. And the strength of that is a very phenomenal thing. So it's use this as a uh, perhaps a moment to go, you know what, I can do this myself and I can do part of this with my team and we can do part of this with our government department. And I think that's the thing, uh, particularly as a, a network of people in the way that Catherine said, we can do this together. Thank you, Paul and Audrey. F final, final thought for everyone. OK, uh, well, I, I've pasted a few links, uh, but if you want to feel upbeat and you want a new book, uh, I think John Alexander's book is pretty good. Uh, it's called Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us. Uh, and I, I really think that uh, really any book will lead you to pretty much the same insights. Uh, and the important thing is just to uh, simply start uh, practicing, uh, to, to start to deal with. And um, as often mentioned, uh, none of this it's rocket science now. Uh, they're all off the shelf technologies as robust as Slido uh, or whatever Google form uh, we're using right now. Uh, and there's tons of already pretty good um, experiments that's already been done before um, they solidify. So just feel free to uh, share and uh, enjoy and optimize for fun, I guess. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and I'll, I'll tell John you recommended him. We'll be delighted. Um, so last job of the day for me is to thank everyone for their time. Um, Catherine and Paul, thank you very much for being with us this morning and helping us to understand how this um, feeds into UK politics and policy. Uh, and of course, thank you so much um, to Audrey. I can see from the Slido that you have you have blown a few minds this morning, um, which is which is definitely a result. That was what we were looking for. So thank you to everyone on the panel. Thank you to my colleagues in the policy profession for making it happen. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming along. Uh, I, I sense already lots of energy for continuing the conversation in some form. So we'll look at how we can do that. And on that note, um, I will bring the session to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Live long and prosper. <laughs>